My favorite thing about being on social media is how easily you can talk to friends, chat about your daily life, and text them as often as you want to. And sometimes even get to meet new people and be friends with them. People you might not have met in real life who have the same interest as you whom you instantly click with them and you find yourself talking to them every day. I had an Instagram friend, Alyssa, and although she doesn't live in Ohio, where I live, it didn't stop us from becoming the closest of friends. She would send me funny memes, and I would often tell her about all the things I did, not even leaving out the mundane parts of them. Alyssa was a good listener and supportive friend, and she always seemed to have the best bits of advice. I've known her for over half a year, and we haven't met. I was eager to see her in person, to be able to hug her, hold her, and talk about boys and annoying college professors. I wanted us to go to my favorite ice cream place together, go to parties, and just have a blast. So, when Alyssa texted me through Instagram that she was coming to Ohio for Halloween, I was elated to say the least. I couldn't believe I was finally meeting my Instagram friend. I began to count down the days until she came, wondering how it would feel to finally see her in person. She came to Ohio only two days before Halloween. The streets were already riddled with Halloween decorations, and children and adults alike were all thinking of either trick-or-treating or parties to attend. I was a sort of loner who didn't have friends in real life, but none of that mattered since Alyssa was coming. I finally met her the day after she arrived. It was only a day until Halloween, and I still hadn't picked out my outfit. I was beginning to think I wouldn't be going to any parties this year, but Alyssa was quick to change my mind. She was as lovely in real life as she was on Instagram, and just as gorgeous. She hugged me tightly and told me all about the Halloween party of the year that was going to be here in Ohio. It was a huge deal, as all the big influencers on Instagram would be there, she said. It'll be so fun if you come with me to the party. Please, Beth. Alyssa exclaimed while grinning. I wasn't sure at first, but Alyssa made it sound like it was the best event in town. But I don't even have a Halloween outfit, I said to her. But Alyssa only shook her head as though it wasn't a problem before pulling out two matching outfits from the duffel bag she had come with. I gasped as she pulled out two identical saw outfits from the ghastly white and red mask to the gangly suit that was somehow made sexy. Alyssa even had two saws with her that looked so realistic I couldn't believe they were only costumes. They looked like if I were to press my finger against the jagged ends of the saw, it would chop it off. I had no idea she was this prepared, and I didn't have another reason for not going anymore. If anything, the costumes made me excited to go. And the party is going to be live streamed on Instagram, so you better perform your best. Alyssa wiggled her brows as she said it, and I laughed even though I had no idea what that meant. But it seemed like she thought of it as a big deal, and I was ready to do anything my friend wanted to do. At that moment, I had no idea how terrible it could all be. The party was a few streets away from my house, and the house was a little hidden from the main roads. Alyssa mentioned how parties could go with them, and nobody wanted the cops to be notified of any of that. I didn't plan to drink that much at a party where I only knew Alyssa, so the talk of cops didn't bother me. The party had already started when we got there, so many people were dressed as horror movie characters with axes and real looking guns, and the most gruesome versions of innocent characters like Alice in Wonderland. It looked like every murderer's wonderland, and I was fascinated by the designs and how much attention to detail there was. Isn't this all great? Alyssa said as she passed me a cup of punch, and I downed it immediately, only to realize it was spiked. I nearly choked on it and made a mental note to not drink any more of it. I nodded along to whatever Alyssa said while I felt the heaviness of the saw I was holding. Alyssa leaned down and muttered to my ears, Be careful with that saw. It can cut through bone. I made sure of it. Oh, and make good use of it. She winked at me, but before I could say anything else, the lights dimmed around me. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the faces. If you wanna play tough, you wanna hate this, I'll make sure up. I didn't understand what was going on until it was too late. I could see the video cameras that were live streaming on Instagram. Everyone could see the Halloween party. And it took me too long to realize that this wasn't a regular party. This was a massacre! A ringing sound exploded through unseen speakers while people waited with held breaths, and the nightmare began. People wore their Halloween masks tightly and drew their weapons. Within seconds, all I could see was red. 
I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love For the fakeness, if you wanna play tough, and wanna hate this I'll always show up, and make a statement I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love For the fakeness, if you wanna play tough, and wanna hate this I'll always show up It was a massacre, and I was in the middle of it I couldn't move I was panicking and I stood rooted to my spot. Cries of victory and anguish were all I heard around me as more gunshots punctured the heads and eyes of people. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. I couldn't believe what was going on. I needed to leave, but my head began feeling dizzy. I could barely walk or make a path. And that was when Alyssa came to me. Her eyes were twinkling and blood that wasn't hers coated the saw she was holding. Having fun? She said with a sickly smile. I wasn't. I wanted to leave and never come back. I wanted the cops to barge in and stop this mess. I told Alyssa that I wanted to leave, but she said I couldn't. That the viewers of the private Instagram stream were enjoying this bloodbath, and I needed to kill to survive. She said all I had to do was survive for the next five minutes and it would all be over. But surviving meant getting my hands wet with the blood of others in this room, and I wasn't sure I could do that. I was living a Halloween nightmare. I begged and cried for it to end, but no one was willing to listen. I guess it wasn't a good idea to have an Instagram friend after all, because now I wasn't sure I had what it took to be Alyssa's friend. Last week, I took a 48-hour bus ride to visit my aunt and uncle in Denver. Most of the way, I listened to music through my earbuds while an old red-haired woman snored loudly next to me. By the time we crossed into Colorado, my earbuds had run out of battery, so I couldn't listen to music anymore. I decided to use the bus's Wi-Fi and scroll through Instagram. I'd been posting photos of the scenery through my whole trip, and I saw that a lot of people were commenting. Suddenly, I got a new notification for a new follower some dark-haired guy named James. I didn't recognize his photo and his account was set to private, so I didn't follow him back. The bus stopped for a 30-minute bathroom break in some mountain town and we all had to get out. I walked around the bathrooms and snapped some photos of the mountains in the distance. By the time I was finished, the driver was already calling for us to get back in the bus. I went to my seat, but the red-haired lady was no longer sitting next to me. Instead, it was a young guy with dark hair. It took me a second to realize that it was James, the one who had just followed me on Instagram. I guess he'd been sitting behind me for the whole drive. I smiled at him and then sat down. He introduced himself and explained that the red-haired woman had gotten off at the last stop and he wanted to sit next to me. He asked if it was okay I was a bit creeped out, but I was too awkward to tell him no. The bus got back on the road. James and I chatted for a bit about how beautiful the surroundings were, and he complimented me on my Instagram photos. He seemed like a nice enough guy, but he came on a little too strong. He was acting like we were suddenly best friends, just because he started following me on Instagram. I put my earbuds back in even though they didn't work, just so I had an excuse not to talk to him. He didn't take the hint. He brought up Instagram again and asked me why I didn't follow him back. I politely told him that I would once we got to Denver, but that wasn't good enough for him. He told me to do it right now because he wanted me to see all of his photos. He said that I was an expert photographer and he knew that I'd appreciate his stuff. I begrudgingly pulled out my phone and opened Instagram. I went back to my notifications and found his account. He watched me as I clicked the follow button. I didn't like how insistent he was. I told myself as soon as we got off the bus in Denver, I'd immediately unfollow him. I don't like people telling me what to do. He didn't accept my request at first. He just sat there, smiling at me. Then he asked, Are you extreme? I had no idea what he was getting at. Uh, not really, I said. I am, he told me. Then he waited for me to ask why, but I didn't feel like it. The sun was already setting, though I wasn't really tired at all. He nudged me on the side. Don't go to sleep yet, he said. I want you to see my photos. 
I opened my eyes and turned towards him again. I was about to tell him off, but there was something in his expression that unnerved me. I really didn't want to piss him off. So I looked down at my phone. He'd accepted my friend request, so now I could see everything he posted. And it was horrifying. The description said that he was a special effects makeup artist, and all of his photos were of murder victims. Really gory stuff. Blood oozing down people's faces, severed limbs, corpses. Do you like them? He asked. They're very realistic, I told him. You should see my latest one. I think you'll really like it. He smiled as he posted another photo. It took me a second, but when I saw it on my phone, I gasped. It showed an old red-haired woman with a knife stuck in her head. The same woman that had been sitting next to me for most of the bus ride. I could tell from the background of the photo that it was taken next to the bathrooms at our last stop. James wasn't a makeup artist at all. These photos were real. He murdered all these people, including that poor old lady. But why? Was it just because he wanted to sit next to me? He watched my expression change, waiting for me to figure out that he was a psychopath. You're not going to say anything, are you? He asked. Please, don't hurt me, I whispered. He laughed. <laughs> On a bus filled with people, I would never. It was now pitch black outside, and we still had an hour before we got to Denver. I was frozen in my seat, too scared to move. James wouldn't stop staring at me. Want to see something cool? He asked. I really didn't, but I was too afraid to answer. He reached into the front pocket of his sweater and pulled out a bloody knife. It was the one he used on the red-haired woman, and it was still stained with blood. Cool, right? I can't wait to use it again. Panicked, I started to get out of my seat, but he pulled me back down. I could feel the edge of the knife pressing against my side. He leaned closer and whispered in my ear, Don't make a scene. What do you want from me? I, I promise I won't say anything. I just want you to like my work, he said. I could tell from your Instagram that you have tons of followers, and I'm a little jealous. I want to be popular too. Maybe if I take your photo, I'd get a lot of followers too. I hated that I was so scared. Then I realized that all I needed to do was play by his rules. So I told him that we could take a selfie on my phone and that I'd tag him. He seemed surprised by the offer. But then he put the knife back in his pocket and said, okay. I raised my phone and very quickly snapped a selfie of the two of us. Then I posted it. He looked at the photo on his phone and that distracted him long enough for me to jump out of my seat and run towards the front of the bus. I screamed for the driver to stop. The driver slammed on the brakes and looked at me angrily. I pointed at James who had stood up and told the driver that James had assaulted me. The driver didn't ask any questions. I guess he'd dealt with inappropriate passengers before. He opened the bus door and ordered James to get out, even though we were in the middle of nowhere. James walked down the aisle, smiling from ear to ear. He looked at me just one more time and then walked off the bus. See you soon, he said before the doors closed behind him. I got back in my seat and we kept driving on. It took me a while to calm down. Pretty soon we made it to Denver and I went straight from the bus station to the police station. I told the cops everything that happened, but when I tried to show them James on Instagram, he had already blocked me. The cops assured me that they would look into it. It's been two days now and I still don't know what happened. I haven't looked on my Instagram since.
Last Halloween, I was supposed to go to a costume party with my boyfriend, Ben, but then he broke up with me just a few days before, so I ended up with no plans whatsoever. We'd been together for three years, and the breakup came completely out of nowhere. The only excuse he gave me was that I deserved better. I assumed that he had just found someone else. He packed all his stuff and left town before I could find out what was going on. So on Halloween, I decided to just stay at home and pass out candy to trick-or-treaters and watch horror movies on my couch. And it really wasn't a great night. After sunset, the trick-or-treaters started to come. I saw a few really cute costumes and most of the kids were pretty adorable. But after a while, I started noticing that more and more of the trick-or-treaters were teenagers. Pretty old looking teenagers too. Most of them just grabbed the candy out of my hands without a thank you or anything. It started to get frustrating. In the past, I would have just ignored this, but I was in a pretty awful mental space because of my breakup and I didn't want to put up with any crap. Eventually, these two older boys showed up at my door. Both were much taller than me. One just had a black cape over his normal clothes, and the other one wore a white t-shirt with the word costume written in black marker. They mumbled trick or treat, and then just glared at me until I gave them something. I know I should have just smiled and given them some chocolate, but instead, I told them no. I said they were too old to be trick or treating, and I was saving the candy for actual children. The one in the cape started to say something, but the other one grabbed him by the arm and then whispered something in his friend's ear. Then they both started laughing and walked away. Now, I'm not an idiot. I know that those two were planning some sort of prank on me in retaliation. That's just what teens do. Honestly, I wasn't too afraid. If they end up throwing toilet paper in my yard, I'd just clean it up in the morning. So I closed the door and went back to watching a movie. After that, I only had about 10 more trick-or-treaters come to my door. It was getting pretty late, and it seemed like our neighborhood was starting to wind down. Some time passed, and I completely forgot about those two teens. I was in my living room, forcing myself to stop thinking about my ex. Then out of nowhere, I noticed someone walking around in my backyard. I remembered the teens from earlier and realized that they'd come back. I went to the window to get a better look, and I saw that it was just one of the teens. He'd changed his outfit. Now he was wearing all black, including a black mask that covered his face. The ironic thing was that if he had dressed like that when he was trick-or-treating, I probably would have given him candy. It was an actual costume instead of the half-assed outfit that he wore earlier. I saw something big and long in his arms. He was carrying a baseball bat. That's when I got really angry. Throwing toilet paper was harmless enough, but he was obviously going to trash my place and probably break some windows. I should have called the police, but I was so angry that I didn't even think of that. I ran to my sliding glass door and threw it open. Hey! I shouted. Get out of here! The man looked at me. Instead of running away, he just stood there, slapping the baseball bat against his palm over and over. Up close, I realized that this man was bigger than either of the teens I saw earlier. This was someone else. I slammed the door shut and then locked it, but the man casually walked up to the glass door and stared at me from the other side. He didn't move. Then, in a burst of motion, he slammed the bat against my door. The glass shattered instantly. Then he stepped inside. I looked around for my phone, but I couldn't remember where I'd left it. The man walked slowly toward me. He held the bat against his shoulder. I jumped over the couch and raced toward the hallway. I needed to make it to my bedroom so I could lock myself inside. Just as I reached my bedroom door, he grabbed me from behind and pulled me back. He was so strong, he slammed me against the wall. I screamed for help. While I was on the ground, he kicked me against the side and ordered me to shut up. His voice was low and deep, but it also sounded familiar. This was someone I knew. What do you want? I whimpered. He raised the bat over his head, ready to slam it down. Stop! I begged. Who are you? I'm here for my payment, he said. That's when I realized who this was. I'd met him a few times before, but I never learned his name. He was one of Ben's gambling buddies. He'd always given me the creeps. One time, I caught him slamming Ben against the side of a building and threatening him over something. Afterwards, Ben had assured me that he'd stopped hanging out with the guy, but 
but I guess not. Does, does Ben owe you money? I asked him. B because we're not together anymore. We broke up. He started laughing. <laughs> I don't believe that. That's when it all came together. Ben had got himself mixed up with this guy. He probably owed him a bunch of money. That's why he left me. That's why he fled town. And without Ben here, this guy was after me. With a low grunt, he slammed the baseball bat down. It would have hit me, but I rolled out of the way. Help! I screamed again. I tried to crawl into my bedroom, but he grabbed my ankle and pulled me back. No one's gonna hear you, he said. I couldn't escape. He raised the bat again, but before he could strike me, two figures came out of nowhere and grabbed him by the arms. The baseball bat fell to the ground. I watched in shock as the masked man was pushed onto the ground. The two teens from earlier had come back. They went absolutely crazy on the guy, hitting and kicking him over and over until he was a bloody whimpering mess on my carpet. Then the man stopped moving. I didn't know if he was unconscious or dead. I jumped to my feet and grabbed my phone. I'd left it on the end table. After calling the police, I walked back to the teens and asked what happened. Ah, we came here to toilet paper your house, the one in the cape said. That's when we heard you scream for help. I couldn't believe it. If they hadn't come back to prank me, I would have been killed. Wait right there, I said. Let me get you some candy. Working the night shift was always the worst. It was slow and boring, for the most part, and the only customers we got around here were truckers or the occasional tired worker on their way home. You got any plans tomorrow? My coworker Michael asked, his nonchalant tone making me figure he was only trying to make small talk for the sake of it. Sleeping mostly, I answered with a shrug. These shifts take it out of me, honestly. He gave a dry chuckle. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. He went back to stocking the shelves while I hung back around the register, waiting for the next customer. The next hour passed slowly. It was past one in the morning at this point, and all I could see outside was a heavy blanket of darkness. This 7-Eleven branch was located just off the highway, buried behind a small copse of trees with stretches of rural land off in the distance. I'd barely seen a flash of headlamps pass by, and other than the store's aircon and humming freezers, everything was deathly silent. I could never imagine living somewhere out here. With the dark and the quiet, it was too isolating. I'm gonna go have a cig, Michael told me. You good here for a few minutes? Sure, I said, waving him off, and he disappeared through the staff door, which led to the back entrance of the store. I was alone now, and the place seemed even more eerie. The air was unnaturally still, and I found my gaze scanning the aisles, a strange tension working at the back of my neck. I shook it off, told myself I was being paranoid, I'd been working here for a little over two months, but this was only the second or third time I'd been put on the night shift. I mostly handled early mornings. It was much busier, but at least it didn't feel like I was the only person out here. The automatic doors at the front of the store slid open with a quiet hiss, startling me. I quickly propped myself back up from where I was slouching, ready to greet the customer, and frowned. There was nobody there. I stepped out from behind the register, standing at the open doors and peering out. There was nobody out there either. Maybe it was the wind or an animal that had triggered the motion sensor. I shrugged it off and busied myself tidying up some of the stock on the shelves. Behind me, the doors slid open again. I didn't turn around, figuring it was just the wind again, but then a voice, panicked and desperate, startled me. P Police, help me! I spun around with a start, my eyes going wide as they fell on the girl in front of me. She couldn't have been any older than 18, with a slight frame. But what shocked me was her appearance. Her blonde hair was matted and dirty, her face was streaked with grime, and her clothes were torn and covered in blood. Oh my god, I blurted, fumbling through my alarm. You have to help me, she cried again, her voice trembling. They're coming. They're coming after me. You have to help me, please. Oh, okay, calm down, I said, trying to placate her with my hands despite my own inner panic. 
Are you hurt? Wh who's after you? There was too much to register at once. I barely thought to check outside to see if anyone was still chasing her. She shook her head, her eyes wide and desperate as she flicked a glance over her shoulder. They're coming! Please help me! Who's coming? I asked again. The, the monsters! The monsters from the woods! My mouth opened and closed, no words coming out. Monsters? Was she talking about the people who did this? P please! She cried again, lunging for me suddenly. She gripped the front of me, begging me to help her. Right, yes, I'll call the police, I blurted, hoping Michael returned from his smoke break soon. I didn't know the proper procedures for dealing with something like this. Uh, um, wait here. No, don't leave me, please! The girl cried, tears streaming down her face, streaking through the blood and dirt. They'll find me again! I nodded, finally lifting my gaze and scanning the parking lot through the glass doors. I couldn't see anyone out there, but it was too dark to properly track any movement. All right, stay close, I said. Um, maybe I should lock the doors. The girl nodded vigorously, so I went over to the front entrance. The door slid open when I got close, and a flood of night air washed over me, chasing away the smell of blood. Don't let them in, the girl screamed, but I assured her there was nothing out there. The parking lot was completely empty. All right, I'm locking the doors now, I told her, activating the mechanism to stop the automated motion sensor. Nobody can get in. Stay here, okay? I'm going to go and call 911. I'll be right back. The girl nodded, her gaze darting between me and the locked doors. Are you sure they can't get in? Positive, I said, before hurrying through the staff door to the lockers where I kept my phone. I called 911, explaining who I was and what happened, reeling off the address of the 7-Eleven store I worked at. I was told the closest station was at least 15 minutes away and to hold tight while the cops came. Fifteen minutes was far too long to be trapped in here with a strange girl screaming about monsters, but I didn't have a choice. Where the hell was Michael, anyway? He'd been gone for at least ten minutes already. His smoke breaks usually only lasted five. I debated going out and looking for him, but I didn't want to leave the girl on her own, so I headed back to the front of the store. When I pushed through the staff doors, the storefront was empty. The girl was gone. I blinked. Hey, uh, are you still here? I called, cursing myself for leaving her alone. What if this was all some kind of ruse and she was actually robbing? Uh, I'm here, a quiet voice called, and the girl poked her head out from behind one of the aisles. I saw them. I saw them outside. They found me. Her words struck panic into my chest. What? The, the people who did this, are they here? My eyes went wide darting frantically at the open doors and windows. The girl sobbed. Oh, God. They're going to kill me. They're not. I promise they won't hurt you. I tried to reassure her, despite my own fear. Exactly who was after her? They can't get in, okay? The girl started crying, pulling her knees up to her chest and rocking back and forth. I still didn't know if she had any injuries, but the blood must have come from somewhere. Are you hurt? I have a med kit, I said, walking towards her slowly, like she was some kind of injured animal. I didn't want to startle her into doing anything dangerous. The girl shook her head. They didn't hurt me too bad, she said, sniffing as she outstretched her arm. I gasped when I saw her wounds, stumbling back in surprise. Three long gashes ran along her arm, smeared with blood and dirt. Was it an animal that attacked you? I asked. Those look like claw marks. The girl shook her head desperately. It, it wasn't an animal, she said. I, I told you it was a monster. In the time it took for the police to arrive, I managed to bandage up some of her wounds, but I was still no closer to finding out who or what had hurt her. She kept talking about the monsters in the woods and how they had chased her, but I couldn't make much sense of her story. I figured her mind must be muddled with the shock of it all. This whole time, Michael never came back either. It hadn't really struck me until the cops arrived and asked if I was the only one here. I told them my coworker had stepped out for a smoke break but had never returned. When they took a look outside at the back entrance, it was nowhere to be seen. But they found his mobile a short distance away, 
the screen completely smashed. The girl was taken into police custody. An investigation was launched into Michael's whereabouts. Suspicion was cast on me to begin with, but the security cameras inside the store proved that I had nothing to do with it. Michael's body was discovered a few days later in the woods. His body had been completely torn apart. Local authorities said they'd never seen anything like it. An animal would have at least eaten part of the body, and a human wouldn't have been capable of tearing up a part like that. Sadly, whatever monsters had been chasing that girl must have gotten Michael as well.